All right. Hi, welcome to Mental Health Monday. This month for Mental Health Monday, we're talking about curiosity and autonomy and shame, as well as our cognitive processes. So cognitive itself is kind of a large loaded word, but we're just talking about thinking about thinking, right? We want to talk about our right. uh, the gifts that God has given us to be able to delve into knowing things and finding out more and growing and exploring and all of that. And so we have our special guest, Dr. Kim Markshausen with us today. Hi, Kim. Hi, it's good to be back. We're excited. I'm so excited to have you each month because we're just going to keep building, I think, on these layers of theory that we're talking about, but then what they actually look like in our life. Right. So so considering, yeah. just for fun, um, while we wait for people to kind of show up for Mental Health Mondays, what is something that makes you curious, Kim, or what do you really like to think about when you have free time to think? And for our guests... Throw up in the comments, you guys, what do you like to think about? What kinds of things make you curious? Well, I can I can tell you about something I like to think about that I haven't been able to for a while because I'm no longer teaching in an elementary classroom. But I've been reminded of that because I've got these little neighborhood boys who keep coming to my house. They kept wanting to sell me things like rocks and their toys. And so <laughs> I'm, the mother in me is going, okay, what's going on here? But um, I talk them into doing yard work for me. So we've got this team of eight year olds who come and do yard work. And I love to listen to the way they talk to each other and think what's behind that, mm -hmm. you know, what, mm -hmm. and, and what's going to motivate them to keep doing this so that when they're older and they can actually do a good job. <laughs> Ooh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So your educational psych vantage point is always on, you know, high alert, like what, what will help them learn to be the That's people right. they need to be eventually. And, and what experiences have they have that have built them into these little humans and this oh, big human? Gosh, you're are. in my head. You're in my head. <laughs> I know, right? No, I love that. I, uh, for me, I'm curious about pretty much anything. Like if someone brings up, um, I don't know, astrophysics, I'm like, oh, tell me more. Like I want to know more. You know, I really like find out more. And I think it's one reason I, I, well, first of all, I just believe questions are the building block of relationship, you know, but also being able to, um, for me, questions are such a huge part of life. Like I want to hear more about everything out there. And and probably that's some of my own mental health stuff going on actually is like, yes, oh, I'm all over the place at all times. But the if I could pick anything to think about besides probably Jesus on one hand over here, also Jesus connected to this other thing is people's experiences, whether traumatic or not traumatic, regular, every day, and how those do build them into the people that you see before you that you're having a conversation with. Um, you know, I just think it's fascinating how our brain and our networks and all of that are knit by God in the beginning, but then knit every day as we interact and connect. So I love yeah. that those brain structures are built so that we are in fellowship. Mm, isn't it's that... built so that we are connecting with each other. And that is the very essence of every kind of learning. Right, right. No, exactly. Yeah. I love it. Thanks for that that knowledge bomb right there, Dr. Kim. <laughs> um, um, so today we're going to talk about the cognitive process and, and our uh, thoughts and how uh, we are built to have thoughts. And that uh, works with the rest of our bodies and our hearts and our strength, if you will, and our souls. Uh, but but there's a lot of theories around cognitive growth. So can you tell us a couple of the most influential, I guess, the most foundational yeah. of those theories? Yeah, my, my two favorite would be Piaget and Vygotsky. And it's interesting because they're contemporaries of each other, but they did never really mix because mm -hmm. Vygotsky was in Russia, Piaget in Europe, and there wasn't a lot of combination. But oh my goodness, there's a dinner I want to sit on, the two of them <laughs> talk, talking about it. But um, they're both constructivists. And you mm. were hinting at that earlier. You're really getting me excited about talking about cognition, about how our brains take our experiences and then construct knowledge out of that. Mm -hmm. And that's how our brains will help us to adapt to our world, to wherever mm. we are at. So um, I think maybe the best way to explain it is that is to talk about if you were teaching a toddler the, the concept of car. 
if you were a behaviorist, you'd probably get a picture of a car or a toy car and you'd just keep saying car and pointing to it. And if they could say car, then, oh, good, we've learned they it. Know. Right. <laughs> they know. Piaget would say, no, that child doesn't really understand car until they've been in a car and they've ridden around in it and they've had an experience in there. Now they know what a car is. And then Vygotsky would add a little bit more to that. And he would say, he, he's what we call a social constructivist. So he would say that child really understands car when that child realizes the car brings mom and dad back from work or the car takes me mm -hmm. to like grandma's house. <clears throat> and you can see how the car fits into your family culture. Mm, oh, I really like that. That's really helpful because that, well, and I think you can see how different theories are impacted by other theories because I hear a lot right. of systems theory and cultural theories in that, that we are in our time and place and that has to be taken into consideration um, and within our language and within our relationships. And like you said, made to connect, made to be in fellowship with one another yeah. and how that back and forth influences the way we see even a simple concept like car that's going to look a lot different for me than it reminds me of a story I read in a book one time I think it was radical was the book it could be a different one but the, it was just talking about uh missional involvement and things and there was a pastor from a country in Africa and he had said he had come to the United States and he came back to his congregation to talk about his experiences all he learned at this seminary and things like that and he said the thing that really stuck out to him the most was that they have houses over there for their cars <laughs> like, yeah. and he was talking about a garage right like but in his yeah. culture in his time and place that was a completely out of the box concept and it created new thoughts, new ideas. Um, yeah, and I think that really influences our creative processes then, as well as our ability to have and be in relationships and what that looks like. And it's important too when we read scripture. Mm. To, to pay attention to our cultural biases when we read scripture and to be able to um, listen to teachers who can teach us what's the background, whether mm. it's what's the background on the Greek or the Hebrew or mm. what was happening at that time, because yeah. it's a different story when you know the culture. Yeah, and I do notice that that influences the way we are able to be taught to when someone like the person teaching us is aware of our culture on this end too. So my husband and I have been talking about this a lot lately, like there's bad translations of scripture because someone didn't understand the Greek and Hebrew. There's also bad translations of scripture because they had their cultural bias and didn't understand the reader's place then as well. Right. And so different areas of scripture where we see concepts, I see this especially with concepts that involve community versus unity. I, I see certain yeah. areas where yeah. we might want to consider some translational adjustments because that term unity isn't translating cognitively for us the way it once was. So we might right. need to use new terms or have a teacher who can explain how that works within our culture at this place in time. So I've well, got to what I, I, might be what I like about this is that we're demonstrating um, two different ideas about cognition. If I can jump yes. in and take over. <laughs> do so, do so. so but, but one of them is is this idea of disequilibrium. I really, really like it. Now, Piaget would say you're in a state of equilibrium if the things that you're hearing make sense with mm -hmm. the concepts that you have okay. in your brain. Mm -hmm. And when you come face to face with something that doesn't make sense, you are uncomfortable. That's mm. disequilibrium because your brain mm. wants to fix it. It's like, and mm, it has to change. Hard something. thinking. Like, right, right. Yeah. And so, and Vygotsky would say what we're doing now is intersubjectivity, oh, where we more. might be tossing little bits of um, disequilibrium at each other, little bits of something new or uncomfortable, and then talking it through and mm. assimilating it and understanding it. Okay, what is that term again for that, Kim? Um, you want disequilibrium or inner subjectivity? Inner subjectivity. Inner okay. subjectivity. I think we're going to have to, on the reverse end of this, after maybe we can make a couple of graphics so people can engage with those terms a little bit more because I think that's yeah, really helpful, yeah. being able to identify. And this is where the shame component comes in. When we can mm -hmm. identify, and uh, that has to do with emotional granularity, right? Like giving some language to that discomfort, giving some language to, I, I, I want 
want to understand what you're saying. So we're working through this now. I think those two terms are really helpful. If we can call them by name and be like, oh, that's what's going on in my psyche. That's what's going on in my cognition. Or that might be what's going on for that person sitting across for me. So what can I do? So when you, you know, see that in ourselves or other people, what are some ways we can respond, Kim, do you think? And maybe I'm throwing you under the bus here, but so that we are not, I think, feeling that weight of shame of like, oh, I just don't get it. I must be, you know, as an EMDR therapist, I hear people say those cognitions, like they they don't say them out loud, but their system is saying, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I don't know, you know, when God is saying, just take a minute. We're we're working on this together, you know. Right, so what are right. some ways we can talk to our psyches or help in a conversation with someone else who's experiencing disequilibrium, if you will, or that yeah. inner subjectivity? Did I say that right? Inner subjectivity. Okay. Yeah. How do we respond to that in our lives? Well, you know, I mean, maybe one way to look at it is to think about what happens on social media when you have a discussion versus what happens face to face when you have a discussion. Because in, in the social media, we um, we kind of turn away from disequilibrium. If someone posts something that makes us uncomfortable, instead of wanting to engage with them and find out why they feel that way, we kind of default to assuming Mm-hmm. what they want mm-hmm. you know we and make I, up yeah Brene Brown calls it the stories in our head like yeah. so our cognition flips to making the story in our head about what that person is saying about us or to us right. yeah mm-hmm. or about about anything and yeah. the, the phrase that I see most often or hear people saying most often that really um causes disequilibrium or uncomfortableness for me is um they just want to you know, like oh, this political oh. party just wants to, or you just okay. want to. That's helpful. And if you find yourself saying that, man, you, I have to stop myself and say, um, you know, I know Heidi pretty well, but I can't read her mind. Mm, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, and that's one thing that Brene Brown, again, would agree with, is like calling out that story in your head. What's, she says, ask yourself, what's the story in my head? You know, that's a tool, like you said. Yeah. Um, uh, am I trying to read minds? <laughs> like, you know, and yeah. as um, Christians too, we understand the idea of best perspective. And this is a very eighth commandment issue, right? Like taking a step back and giving that person the best perspective. But all of this that we're talking about takes cognition, you know, it takes thinking through it and being aware that that isn't all that's going on inside of us, though. I noticed that. As Christians, we think we should be able to think our ways out of these situations. Like we should be able to just give them the benefit of the doubt if we're going to, you know, counter that just with another just. But instead, recognizing the sensations going on in our body that are related to what we talked about last month with attachment and with our needs for connection and community and understanding that those some of those emotions and some of those bodily sensations of discomfort will just rise up those things we don't necessarily control but what we can control is some of this feedback we're giving to ourselves and and entering into like maybe letting something sit for a minute and returning to it or moving the conversation to another platform or to an in-person or something like that we have control over some of that so that's what subjectivity is not a debate you know, it's not you saying your thing and then I say my thing and then we get points. Inner subjectivity is about being willing to change, even in a small way, your way of thinking because of the influence of something someone else has said. Ooh, and okay. I think that's an excellent description of witnessing or sharing your faith. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we can't share our faith by saying, oh, this is what the Bible says you ought to be doing. Right. Well, yeah, right. it's true. The Bible is a wonderful guide, but it's that inner subjectivity, that creating that relationship, mm. that hearing that person's story and then helping them apply faith to that. That's inner subjectivity and that's cognition and that's sharing mm-hmm. your faith. Yeah. And it does sound like that's one reason that takes time. So it sounds mm-hmm. like inner subjectivity takes some time, right? Yes. So it's not something that happens in an instant. I suddenly understand yeah. that's equilibrium is when I'm like, oh, and you kind of feel those brain rockets go off. Like that's also, again, a positive sensation. Like we love it. 
Uh-huh. What is the positive sensation, I would ask, as a, as a therapist, what's the positive sensation related to inner subjectivity? And I think it is what you just said is that connectedness. Like, uh-huh. so paying attention to that sensation inside of us, what does it feel like for you to be connected to someone else in conversation? Because then that's the feedback we're going to want to look for in other conversations and even bring to ourselves. So <clears throat> if our conversation's at a place where it's only disequilibrium and I'm only uncomfortable, how can I move it to a place that's maybe um, not totally comfortable, but a place that's more yeah. process oriented and working through it? Well, if we think about the emotional connection, because we don't really think or learn or do anything without emotions connected to it, as Ooh, much as we'd you, like to be Spock. Ooh, can, can we I make a graphic that? of that too? Like, woo, all my happy things, right? Yes, we, we don't think, do, or do anything outside of our emotional experience. Although, right. again, Heidi's thing, emotions inform us, they don't lead us, but they are in everything. So sorry, continue, Kim, I love that. That's, that, that's a great thing to point out. Um, if we were happy all the time, happiness, we would not even notice it. But so if we were in equilibrium all the time, um, we wouldn't notice, we wouldn't feel good about it. So when we're in equilibrium and then we find something that, oh, that's different. I need to think about it. I need to work it. And if we can mm-hmm. say to ourselves, it's okay to feel that. Mm-hmm. I don't have to dig in my heels and say, no, you're wrong. I can sit with that information a little bit and listen to you and talk to you about it and know that once it's resolved, I will feel equilibrium again and it will feel much better. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. And I think in order to get to that growth, right, to get to that place where we can say, oh, okay, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to do this. One thing I noticed that is also very helpful is to find the thing that we do either agree with or that we do understand. Right. So there's usually a nugget of something in there. Or when I, especially when I disagree with someone, I ask myself, what's the truth in what they're saying? Because there's usually a nugget of something, right? Uh-huh. And so then pan out from there. So if you're struggling to understand, if you feel like like the, the burden of that disequilibrium, look for the piece to start with, right? The piece that right. makes the most sense to you and then grow out and up from there. And that's what we do, right? So this is childhood cognition is like you said, we show the child the car and we tell them that's a car and we talk about the letter C and we say vroom and we do all these different things. We give them a ride in the car. We show them seatbelts, right? But then you you construct, right? I, I love recognizing that's exactly what's happening. That's why it's called constructivists, right? You construct uh, your ideas and your thoughts that connect into ideas based on that. And so kids have more experiences and they become adults who when someone says something about, this sounds really ridiculous, but it, I think it's true when someone says something about whether you should buy a foreign made automobile or an American made automobile and we're in an argument about this and stuff now, we can enter that because there's pieces of it that we completely can wrap our head around. Does that, am I making sense? Yeah, and, and I think what I would bring it back to is the idea of play, because I know we're both big play opponent, yeah. or <laughs> proponents. Proponents. <laughs> sometimes I call myself a play evangelist Ooh, because I talk I'm about it that so up, often. Yeah. But that's that process of the child constructing knowledge is playing with everything, playing with it in different ways, trying things. In fact, um, Piaget says fluency before accuracy, which is Mm -hmm. something that really made me think the first time I heard it. But that's like the child playing, doing role playing something again and again and again Mm -hmm. until they understand it, until they can be Mm -hmm. accurate with it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had um, a class one year where the mother of one of the students um, died of cancer and the kids started building Um, with our large blocks, they would build coffins. Mm -hmm. And then someone would get in and they'd close the lid and then they'd open the lid and that child would get out. And I had to stop myself from stopping them. I mean, I did communicate with parents about it, but I said, I think this is how they are working through this idea. And then to help parents understand, you know, they're not only role-playing death, but they're role-playing resurrection too. (laughs) <laughs> and isn't that right? Again. Right. Yeah. And and yeah. we call that a cognitive interweave that we give in therapy. Right. So so I, play is a child's first language. And I would propose 
that as we grow, that shape of play just changes. And so like right. English and, and verbal language might be our first language as we grow, but it's still a very important component of the way we make sense of the world is play. So I, I'm really building a lot of resources around this right now of how we play as we grow. Um, but watching children, it's amazing as a trauma therapist, what they will work out for themselves in play. It's a really beautiful process. It does, again, take time. And sometimes we're uncomfortable with that. We want it to take care of itself immediately. Um, but we call it a cognitive interweave. So there may be the children just going in the coffin, you know, and then they're coming out and you get to give them some language for that of, isn't that awesome that God gives us new life? I don't even have to say a whole lot else, right? I don't need to explain it, and I can. I mean, I can create a lesson out of this, right. but sometimes we don't wanna disrupt it too much. And I, I kind of heard that in yeah. what you were saying, right? Let them have their process, give them a little piece to integrate at a time. And as adults, this is one way I think that we take shame on is when someone tries to give us a cognitive interweave, if you will. When someone says, we so often it, think we're doing that in correction, but again, instead, if we're asking a question, that interweave is gonna be able to be taken because we're doing the introspective. We're like turning on all the buttons in our brain that say, let me consider that thought instead of you did something wrong or you are bad, that you don't understand this correctly. Does that also yeah, make so sense? so much more yeah. about that relationship than about the debate mm -hmm. yeah. or a lecture. Because That's so true. I yeah, I could have done um, a nice lesson on death for those five-year-olds, and mm -hmm. it would have gone in one ear and out the other. And mm -hmm. instead, we let them play, and then they learn it, it. It goes to their heart. God speaks to them a little bit each time they right. they do that. Yeah, and I would propose that in an adult system, it conversation feels the same way to us. So mm -hmm. in, that's our play, right? I mean, there's a lot of other things that are maybe more recreation, but I think a lot of play that we experience as adults is that relational connection. And so if we're having a back and forth connection or conversation um, and we're answering questions and asking questions of one another, I'm going to be able to take your ideas a lot more than if we're, like you said, creating a lecture basically, like setting ourselves sure. up to transmit information. I think so often we think of cognition as transmitting information and capturing information, but mm -hmm. it's much more complicated than that. There's a lot of systems at work. Well, you know, if, if you think about the brain science, um, when we learn something, it's not uh, like in a cell that's tucked away in a drawer somewhere in our brain. It's a neural connection and the, the electrical current flows right along that neural connection, but that neural connection has connections to a hundred other things too, mm -hmm. which is why if you smell cinnamon, you're suddenly remembering Christmas mm -hmm. at grandma's house with cinnamon rolls or a, an emotion about mm -hmm. one thing being up. I could be upset about something you say, and really I'm upset about something that happened 10 years ago with mm -hmm. someone else. It's all connected mm -hmm. like that. And, and so play, whether it's playing with toys like children or the kind of adult play that you're talking about. And that can also include anything that puts you in a state of flow that is that just pulls you in because you enjoy mm -hmm. it, whether it's playing music or working on crafts or writing. Mm -hmm. um, that it, You're pulling up so much in your brain because everything's connected to everything else. Yeah, and that's a lot of where, um, you know, some anxiety is like chemical components going on. So mm -hmm. if, um, you know, something's not quite right with my thyroid or I have a hormonal imbalance, those kinds of things, some anxiety is created from that. But some is also from that kind of connective networks that you're talking about, where I think I'm only thinking about this one thing but my brain is attaching the thread around to everything else and so this is right. one reason we have unique therapeutic methods like I use EMDR eye movement desensitization and reprocessing in my office um, because we know now that God has given us this information um, given us this way for our brains to heal and I believe that so firmly that we have a creator that can create a way for our broken bones to heal we have such a hard time believing that our creator also gives a way for our our brains to heal and those cognitive processes that we set over here as, as like thinking processes also have solid 
science and DNA and all of that structure behind it. And we are just now at the forefront of being able to identify some of what's going on with that. And I think we're going to be in the next years just wowed by the creator more and more of what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah, inside of us. So Kim, before we sign off today, can you take some time to give us some ideas about how then we, um, our understanding of cognitive development, our understanding of that disequilibrium, equilibrium, and all of that good stuff, our idea of constructive thinking, the fact that it builds on our experiences. How does that um, change first, I guess, the way that we impact children? I think that's important. Like one thing about how we impact children, but then also how does that change the way that we um ourselves like walk around this world if you will so a couple tips before we leave well i i have like about five different things i can talk about quickly okay. that i think that give you a picture of how the brain learns something new and i think they're good um things to remember not only for working with children but also for working with yourself or working with yeah. others but awesome. um so I'll, I'll describe them in terms of children because that's what, I, what will come to my brain more quickly. Um, but first of all, children find things that they learn in a family to be the most important. Their brains mm. will mark that as being important. Like, so it's like that's, a little flag, right, on uh-huh, the file. It, yeah. If my family's doing it, it's important. And so I think as adults, we're like that way with our perhaps our church family or our group of friends too. Um, secondly, repetition. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we see so much education as being about school and doing a particular lesson, but the brain is all about how many times does this happen? Mm-hmm. And for me, that's so comforting to know that if I don't get something right the first time, my brain just needs me to keep repeating it. Right. Yeah. I like so, that because that does release some of the shame too, so that our brains actually are made so that they prefer if we poke at them more about this one thing instead of, I didn't get it the first time, now I feel like there's something wrong with me. We're actually made to hear it again and again and again. That's really helpful. Thanks, Kim. Keep that's going. that fluency before accuracy thing mm-hmm. right there. And And our brains are taking statistics. If this happens a lot, mm-hmm. it's also important. Mm-hmm. That, that's the other thing. Um, and also, if what I'm doing happens in more than one place. Mm. So, um, you know, if, if my children are hearing about God at church, that's wonderful. Um, and if they're hearing about in school, too, that's even better. And if they're hearing about it at home, there's another thing that the brain says that this is important, too. And mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm sure that as a therapist, you probably give homework to your clients and say, we're mm-hmm. going to talk about this here, but I want you to also think about this somewhere mm-hmm. else. And you know that if your client comes back and say, well, I was talking to a friend about this, mm-hmm. you're happy about that. Yes. Aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I know the good work is getting done. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and then that language connection too um, is so important because our all the constructivism that happens in our brain is built on language. In fact, an infant is born already beginning to learn language because that um, infant that's a few hours old will turn to the voice of his parents. Mm. So God designed that infant to recognize the sound of parents' voice before he was even born. I mean, why would an unborn baby need to be able to process hearing? Mm-hmm. except for that. That's how important that language is. So again, we come back to that talking about things and and thinking about it and processing it that way too. Mm-hmm. Um, but also if we're talking about children doing things with them, mm-hmm. you know, we don't, we don't teach children things very well in a lesson. We teach them like um, the verses from Deuteronomy tell us we as we're walking along the way, as we're sitting, as we're standing, when we rise in the morning, when we go to bed at night, just we learn the important things throughout the course of the day. Mm, That's really good. And the other thing I hear in that verse, as you say it, is the we of it. So Uh we learn better in connection than also. Very much so. Yes, all of those uh, circuits are going where they need to go and responding brighter, if you will, is the term I'm going to use, because we did it in a connected way. Um, It's going to stick. It's stickier, I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, the brain sees it as important. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things the brain looks for. The brain doesn't look for a really cool PowerPoint. 
I always had to tell myself that when I when I teach. You don't say. I love my PowerPoints, but the brain's not looking for that. (laughs) No, that makes sense. And that's why, so when I give some presentations, I have a PowerPoint. But when people ask for a retreat, or when I kind of understand and start to unpack what kind of experience they're looking for, very often I will not have a PowerPoint. I will have a listening guide with discussion parts built in, and then also individual reflection moments, which everyone just loves to hate because it's that mindfulness that's kind of uncomfortable where we're sitting in silence with one another, but it's still a connected silence, right? And so our brain can learn that information because we took the moment to connect it with one another better than if I was just like shouting off things like, hey, take care of your mental health. You know, that isn't quite as sticky as us having a conversation about it and processing that together. And it brings us back right to the beginning too, um, because I remember learning about Piaget as an undergrad and it made no sense to me. Uh, But when I taught it to graduate students, they would eat it up because they had examples of real life experiences Mm -hmm. to connect it to. Mm -hmm. That shows you how important those real life experiences are. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I appreciate that. Well, and our guests were really quiet. We had we had guests here, but they were like, I think they're just soaking in that information. And so I, I know, would... the disequilibrium, and there's, there's no quiz, people. There's no quiz. There's no quiz, <laughs> yes. right? But I think it would be curious if you've been watching with us or if you're watching the archive, I think we'd love to see your comments about what parts you thought were helpful, what really stuck out to you, what maybe you did learn today. Um, and your brain is just trying to do that hard work of of processing it it and engaging with it. Um, But then also, what are some of your experiences of this? Like, what have you seen happen online and in your own lives and your own families that have um, really reflected these concepts, I guess? Because like you just said, sometimes we need to connect it to those experiences so that we understand the concept more. I think that would be helpful. And Kim and I will work on coming up with maybe a couple graphics because I think some of this information is really going to be uh, sticky if we have a way to maybe look at it and just contemplate it a bit longer. Again, there's no shame in being like, oh, I don't quite grasp that concept. I need to see it and I need to hear it again because as Kim just told us, that's how our brain says, oh, it's important. You can can teach me how to use Canvas. Okay, sounds good. There we go. I'll I'll work on that. We'll, We'll... throw you into a little bit of disequilibrium Quite and all a bit. of that good stuff. Well, and I love it. And Michelle just said, like, that's given her a lot to think about, which is, I just think, a clever pun. So I wanted to say it out loud also. Um, that had to come. And then, oh, good. And Debbie's a speech and language pathologist. So this has been really helpful for her, too. So I really appreciate oh, that. Goodness. I think the faith the faith-based components, if anyone has more questions about that in particular, we're happy to address that. Um, but then if you have some individual unique questions, like feel free to throw them up in the comments or you can message me at Heidi Gaiman Writes and um, we will also get a hold of Kim. Make sure you check out Kim's stuff at kimmarkshausen.net um, and you can go to heidigaiman.com to also find a link to her resources and um, this will be available in archive formed on the website tomorrow and on YouTube too. So you can check it out again and look at the show notes and things like that. So thanks for joining us, Kim. We'll see you next month and we're talking moral development right moral Moral development development. some more things to think about (laughs) i know always good i just love it well sounds good thanks for being with us we'll see you all next time bye-bye